many well-meaning, religious, deceived people will quote Romans 6, verse 14, when you mention anything about especially keeping the Sabbath or keeping God's law. But they don't know what the term under the law means. Regardless as to whether or not you know, and I have brought sermons on that subject several times, hitting it in different ways, but if you don't know what the term under the law means, it makes no difference compared, or it makes no difference when you believe the Bible. I'm going to show you today that if you believe your Bible, Hopefully you have one or can get one. But if you believe your Bible, you will realize that the term we are not under the law does not mean the law was done away. Okay? I'm just going to read verses mainly. I'll do a little talking perhaps, maybe, I don't know. But I want to read uh, Deuteronomy 9, verse 9. And you can read the whole chapter. But verse 9 when I was gone up into the mountain, Moses speaking, to receive the tables, the tables of stone. What did he receive? The Ten Commandments on two tables of stone. Is that not right? God writing those Ten Commandments in them with his finger. So Moses says, when I went up to the mount to receive the Ten Commandments, even the tables of the covenant. Well, now wait a minute. The Ten Commandments is the covenant. God offered blessings for obedience. A covenant is the same thing as a contract. I am a carpenter, retired, but I've done work for people and I would tell them what I will do and what I would charge them for my services. And they would either say, You're too much. it's too much, I'm not going to pay it, and I would walk on by or they would accept my terms. And we then had a covenant or a contract. Okay? The covenant or the contract between God and Israel was, here are my Ten Commandments, obey them. Let's go on down to verse 11. We'll read again that the uh, covenant is the ta two tables of stone. Verse 11. It came to pass at the end of 40 days and 40 nights that the Lord gave me the two tables of stone. Even the tables of the covenant. The Ten Commandments is the covenant that God made with Israel. Let's go on to verse 15. And as I say, if you can believe your Bible, then all this stuff that the churches teach about the law being done away with, you don't have to understand what the term means, we're not under the law. You don't have to understand that at all. But you'll know that it does not mean the law was done away. If you believe your Bible. Verse 15. So I turned and came down from the mount, and the mount burned with fire, and the two tables of the covenant were in my two hands. The covenant that God made with Israel was he offered them the Ten Commandments. And the fourth one is remember the Sabbath day. And that's the one that most people don't like at all. You mention the Sabbath day. Oh, we're not under the law. They'll quote that quick, quickly. We're not under the law, but they don't know what they're saying. This sermon is not about the under the law. I've hit that on other sermons. If you can go back, if it's still on the air or still in your notes, you can review to find out what that means. But I want to take you to Deuteronomy 5. I'll just back up a little bit from 9. And I want to read verses 29 of Deuteronomy 5. I'm sorry, I want to read verse 27, and then I'll read 29. 
Go you near and hear, this is Israel talking to Moses now. Go you near, Moses, and hear all that the Lord our God shall say, and speak you unto us all that the Lord your God shall speak unto you. And see, God had written the Ten Commandments into two tables of stone. And we listen to what they say. And we accept the covenant. We will hear and do it. So there was a covenant between God and Israel. And it involved obedience to the Ten Commandments and the law of God. Now I want to read verse 29. God says, oh, that there were such a heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commandments. The Ten Commandments, especially. Always. And it might be well with them and with their children forever. Well, we know the story. Israel didn't keep the law. They didn't keep it. But you see, God wanted Israel to take his law in their heart. Well, we'll turn over to Hebrews 8 now. Hebrews 8. And again, if you can believe your Bible, the new covenant involves the same laws that God wrote in the two tables of stone. The fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath day being one of those ten commandments. I want to reverse. Uh, let's see. Okay, verse 6. It says, But now has he obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant. Jesus is the mediator of a better covenant. Not the covenant that was made as, as Israel, but the covenant that, can made, that has been made with those of us who are here. And can, can be made with anyone who will accept the new covenant. Because let's look at the new covenant. Verse 10. This is the covenant, the new covenant, that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, and you've got to read the Bible here to find what, 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 those, what he's talking about after those days. And I will put my laws into the mind and write them in their hearts. So the new covenant involves the law of God. Israel accepted the law of God and say, we'll live by it, we'll obey it, but they didn't. We need to open our hearts and our minds to the law of God and say, we will obey it and do best, the best we can. I want to show you that Paul, the apostle who is, it is said, was most instrumental in destroying the law of God, saying it's done away with. You don't have to, as a Christian, don't have to pay any attention to that old law. It was nailed to the cross and such terms as that. I want to go back to Romans chapter 7. And again, you can read the, the whole chapter. And he's saying in this chapter that he wants to obey God's law. He wants to do the good of God's law, but he can't because he's a human being. And human beings cannot keep the law of God spiritually perfect. But look what he says in verse 22 of Romans 7. He says, I delight in the law of God after the inward man. That's speaking of his heart. He was accepting of the new covenant. Verse 25. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law. Well, you, if you serve the law, you obey it. It's like if you're going to serve the law of the highway, you obey the speed limit signs, you obey the stop signs, you even obey the yield signs. Not trying to get in front of that guy who's coming down the street, okay? If you obey God's law, you're serving God's law. And Paul said he obeyed it where God put it. The new covenant puts the law, which involves the fourth commandment as well as all ten, Puts it in the heart and in the mind. So without understanding what the term we are not under the law means, if you believe your Bible, you can know that it does not mean that the law of God has been done away and we don't have to worry about keeping it.
Okay, if you want to rise, we'll sing another song. Different platforms, which one will prevail? They differ vastly on many issues. Um, I'm just going to rattle through some of the issues. Um, protecting the Judeo-Christian values or not. As one person said, Christians are going to have to change their views on some things and get out of the way. Um, excessive socialism, big government versus personal freedom. Out of control spending or not so much. I mean, neither party has tightened up, but the last seven years, by the end of the term, it'll be the national debt will have doubled as it'll have increased more than it did from the previous 200 years. Um, open borders versus secure borders. As one politician, according to the email, said, I have a private uh, persona and a public one. And, there, and in, in this meeting of some elites, she said she was for open borders. So you think I mean, what that means. Weak or stronger response to Islamic Jihad. Dumbing down the education system that is Getting rid of Common Core or more Common Core, where they have students, instead of reading the classics, they're reading environmental, well, I consider it um, improper material. Uh, and the math, they get weird math. They're just The t kids are not learning math anymore. They're learning math tricks, and that's not good. Freedom of health care and health care cost. Used to be what you could get was catastrophic insurance. You can't. I understand you can't buy that anymore, but what you do buy really is almost the same, but it costs you like seven or eight times what catastrophic insurance would have cost you. You know, the deductibles are super high. And one party wants to get rid of that. Abortion funding and partial birth abortion. A Supreme Court based on the Constitution or a Supreme Court full of progressive activists. Um, and I want to just, uh, the term progressive, and when you really break it down, it means atheists or agnostics. They really don't believe in God. Um, progressive are, pro progressives are globalist. By globalist, I mean they believe in kind of a world global community, not nationalism, not American exceptionalism or British exceptionalism. They believe in a global community. What does the Bible say about globalism and national sovereignty? Um, <clears throat> and we're going to touch on that in just a second. They, the globalists want a world based on humanistic government and humanistic standards, not biblical standards. Um, and they certainly don't want Judeo-Christian you know, Ten Commandment type standards, definitely. That gets in the way of what they want. Well, let's look at the first attempt at globalism. It's in Genesis 11. We're all familiar with it, but I want to read it anyway, even though it's, it's well known. And Nimrod was the great leader who, if you understand the translation properly, became in place of God. or he would, The government, they looked to him and his leadership instead of God, in place of God. Genesis 11.1. 1. Now the old, whole earth had one language and one speech which is, you know, that's not so surprising. They all came from Noah's family. Verse 4, and they said, now this is the group that was building this capital, Babylon, for the one global nation. They said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. By the way, they were not trying to climb to heaven. That's a misunderstanding. What they meant was, we want to build some, a skyscraper or some skyscrapers that it looks so impressive on, you know, the middle of the world was, back then was uh, the Middle East. Um, that was the center of the world population. And every ancient book agrees with that, where people from many, many miles could see the tops of these, we call them skyscrapers today, and they'd say, wow, look at Babylon the Great, the government of Nimrod and well, Semiramis, etc." That's what they were trying, it was, it was a matter of gaining fame whose top was in the heavens. In other words, it's, it's, it's scraped the sky. That's what skyscraper means. <clears throat> Let us make a name for ourselves. We're going to be famous. You know, everyone was like, wow. 
lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the earth. Because they kind of saw people starting to scatter out after the floods, the population grew all over the world. Um, and God took a look at it. Let's see what God thought about it. Verse 6. This is what God thought. And the eternal, or Jehovah, if you like that translation, said, indeed, the people are one. In other words, they're united. And they have one language. And this is what they begin to do. Now, nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. When you read that, you kind of think, what, what does that mean? I think it meant God knew that with the intelligence of mankind, if they had one government, they could achieve quite a bit. But it wasn't in a godly direction. Now, by the way, you know, in ruins of ancient Babylon, they have found batteries. They were experimenting with electricity way back then. You know, a couple centuries, they would have, well, who knows what they would have invented. Maybe, well, we can start speculating, but they could have done quite a bit and a lot sooner than God wanted it done. Maybe even atomic energy, you know, all kinds of possibilities exist with one language and one government. <clears throat> Nothing will be held with them. God did not like it. It's quite clear. Verse 7, he said, come, let us go down and confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. In other words, what God said is, I don't like this globalism. I see which direction it's taking. Obviously, Satan was in there and human nature was in there and both rebelled against God. And what God did was he divided their language pretty much on tribal national lines so that <laughs> you could imagine what it was like. Maybe the people who have become the progenitors of the people from India, they could not say the thing you're saying. So they went off to the east. People who became the progenitors of China, we cannot say the thing you're saying. But the ones who could speak together went off to become China. And the ones probably from Kush went into Africa and others went into Europe and probably other places into Russia. You can imagine. In other words, what God said was, I want you divided into different nations that can check each other. You know, check and balance, power of, you know, uh, balance of power theory. One nation checks the other. He did not want them united globally because that would be a bad thing. Well, after the Cold War, America was the only superpower, but America was not trying to build a world government or anything that, like, of that nature. And I think America had at least somewhat, even I think the, the communist empire collapsed in 1989. And America, I think Ronald Reagan was president and going out as president, but America still had a pretty benign attitude. So it wasn't like an evil world empire. And American power, and to a lesser extent British power, kind of stabilized the world. I'm not saying it was perfect, because you're going to say, what about this, this, and that? So we have no, we're not talking about utopia or anything like that. Here's what we think is going to happen, and I've already seen it happen in the last three or four years. As America pulls back its power as the stabilizer of the world, but not in a brutal way, just in a you know, more benign way, it creates a political vacuum, which will be filled by bad actors. That's, that's the term they use for bad political dictators. I call them bad actors. And, um, and actually, the argument that, that our current administration, at least is partly the cause for ISIS, is somewhat true. I mean, people, you can debate it. But there are many Islamic groups out there, a whole bunch of them, doing different things. But not until we precipitously left the Middle East, creating that vacuum, and we support it with our power, the Arab Spring. Did all this happen? Now, I'm, I'm, I'm giving the devil a lot of credit and all the bad actors who got in it. But America, maybe, if we had not supported the Arab Spring, you know, we hadn't knocked out Gaddafi and some other, um, I don't remember all the names that we helped take down in power. And isn't the Arab Spring mostly be behind the Syrian civil war? By the way, I'm not saying that the dictators in charge of the Middle East were good guys. See, a lot of times the world is not a question of good guys versus bad guys. That's a simplistic Hollywood television view of the world. It's a question of you have a stable dictator, at least, and this is what I believe has been true of the Middle East, and you can tell me later if you don't agree, Christians were not being persecuted that much in the Middle East. There are like a million Coptic Christians in Egypt. Now they're being 
horrible things have happened to them. There were at least enough Syrian Christians. They had open Easter parade and other stuff in Syria every year, which they don't dare do that now. There'd be genocide. Um, and th those were dictatorships, and I believe that's true in some other countries. But now that the Arab Spring on, it's like we've unleashed a Middle East hell, or at least a partial one. How it goes, we don't know. I'm not going to say for sure how that will all happen. Uh, Great Britain was part of it for a while. Do you remember there was a time when they used the term Great Britain? Nobody ever says Great Britain. It was always Britain. The British Navy used to help rule the sea, or maybe the American and British Navy together. You can forget that. The British don't even have one aircraft carrier. They said their socialism program has eaten that up. I mean, that, that's actually a newspaper quote. So what the, and our, and our globalists want, have been diminishing our military, our navies down to World War I status and number of ships. That's what I've read. Now, granted, maybe we have some better ships than they had then, but, but going down is not a good thing while China is building up. You see, you see what's going on in there. They're one of the bad actors taking over the South Pacific shipping lanes. The point I'm getting is, is our globalists pull America's military down and cooperate in a global community, you all think, we're going to have a global paradise. I don't think so. The globalists have policies that affect our immigration policy, our trade policy, multiculturalism, which says that all cultures are equal. That's not true. Some cultures are dangerous. I mean, downright dangerous. And I don't want to get into that, but... Um, and our, our globalists want some of our national sovereignty to be given to the world, and they hate the exclusiveness of the Bible. See, the Bible says there's only one way for salvation, and there's a set of laws, the Ten Commandments of the core, but other laws, too, that they don't like. They don't like absolutes like that for moral reasons, because they want to do their own thing, but what they want is secular humanism. When, and it sounds good when you listen to them talk about their philosophy. It just doesn't work. You know, if, if you were to read some of the um, communist manifestos and other articles that Solinsky, Saul Alinsky, and those other guys have written, we'll all have one big government. The, the workers' proletariat party will distribute everything equally. All that sounds great. It just doesn't work. Let me just give you a simplistic example why socialism doesn't work. Be like if you were a dad and you had a big ranch, and you had two sons. One son was industrious, and he produced a lot of profit for the ranch. The other son was a ne'er-do-well bum. He did very little. Well, at the end of the year, you tax the productive son. You got too much, and you gave a whole big chunk to the unproductive son. You're equalizing it. What would you have done to both sons? You have demotivated both of them, right? And you can't redistribute wealth that is no longer produced. And the whole communist empire is a whole 19th century history of failure. East Germany, Soviet Union, even the Chinese got away from communism, their, their version of capitalism, what they do now. Vietnam has gotten rid of communism as, as an economic system. They're in the capitalism. It, all over the world, it's proven to be a failure. But somehow, they're still pushing it. And, each, and I think they think it's just because the wrong people were in charge. If you just get a really good leader who knows, the, you know, Bernie Sanders had no uh, trouble getting a ton of young people to buy it because they've been miseducated. They, have, they don't teach you about the, the collapse of the Soviet Union and why it collapsed. And uh, they don't, <laughs> they teach nothing but crap in history nowadays. And that's arrogant of me to say, but that's what I really believe from talking to a lot of students. What did they teach you in public school? And they tell me, we never heard of the Berlin Wall fall. We never heard of that. They don't, teach, they don't teach the Constitution, the Bill of Rights. I've even told lawyers get through law school without actually having to know the. Now, they read articles about the Constitution, but they don't actually read and study the Constitution. That's what they tell me. I said, whoa, have we gone a long way down. Um, and what I think the um, progressives do is they're going to use, at least in Europe and America, they're going to use Islam to weaken Christianity. You see what's wrong with that? It's like, it's like taking, uh, 
put it. What they, in other words, they don't like the, um, the fact that Christianity has a certain direction and the Bible is fairly clear. They don't realize that Islam is the same way, but even worse. Now, the, each side, they think, well, we can control Islam. They're not a problem. There'll just be a minority out there, and we'll use them to kind of undermine the Christians, make religion look bad. But the Islamics are thinking, we'll go along with these guys until, and, and you'll hear me even read, writing about, until we get near the majority, and then we'll turn on them. And, well, you, you get the general idea what their ideas are. And by the way, you might ask, why are there several, at least one I know for sure, Islamic congressman from Minnesota, he supports the most liberal policies, but it doesn't fit Islam or Sharia law. The reason he does that is, I'm giving you my opinion, but it seems quite clear to me, what he thinks is, look, I know that these policies are undermining the American family and making America weaker. But Islamic people, we're not going to do that. We're not going to abort our babies. You fools abort your babies, but we're not going to abort our babies. And they don't. And they don't, as far as I can tell, a lot of the weird marriage stuff, they don't do any of that stuff. They know better, or at least they think they know better. <laughs> In other words, that stuff we're promoting to weaken you so we can eventually take over. And the liberals think they're using them, and the, the others think we're using them. Uh, and I think Europe is now starting to moan from what they thought would offset Christianity and others because they're suffering in Europe greatly now. And what they really want is no room for free speech. By free speech, I mean speech that doesn't agree with them. You know what I mean? Now, if you say the stuff they want to hear, that's wonderful. You know, think about free speech. You don't have to uh, enshrine in your constitution popular speech because if it's popular, it's popular. Freedom of speech was meant to enshrine unpopular speech or if you want to use the, the modern term, politically incorrect speech. But they don't go for the First Amendment about freedom of speech, freedom of religion. As a matter of fact, they've even said sexual freedom trumps religious freedom. And they've actually enacted that in certain laws in certain places. Um, they want to create an anti-Bible world just like the first Babylon leaders do, like Nimrod. Uh, they want a Supreme Court and that will... See, when we think of live and let live, most Christians in today's world said, well, people I don't agree with, they can do their own thing. But that's not what progressives... Progressives want to use the Supreme Court and other courts to force Christians to help them do what they want to do. I want to turn to Jeremiah 6.15 to kind of make a point. Um, some of you kind of know what I mean when I say do what they want to do. Uh, Jeremiah 6.15. <clears throat> now, this is, of course, as Israel was declining morally. And here's what the prophet through God, God through the prophet told them. Were they ashamed when they committed abominations? No. They were not all ashamed, nor did they know how to blush. In other words, they marched around proudly showing their sinful ways, and they didn't even blush. You see a parallel between what's going on in America and that? They're proud of it. <clears throat> Things that they might have been embarrassed about 30 years ago. Um, they don't know how to blush. Therefore, they shall fall among those who fall the time when I punish them. Well, it'd be like what they're doing nowadays. It'd be like if you told a Jewish magazine, hey, there's a Nazi group that wants to buy an ad in your magazine to promote Nazism. And the Jew says, well, that offends my religion. It doesn't matter. He has a right to do it, and you've got to do it, or else we'll put you out of business. That's how they're treating some Christian businesses. And I'm not making this up. At least some I know have gone out of business through the um, fines at certain states and courts have put on them. Um, or it'd be like telling a, a, a Jewish magazine, you got to put in this big ad for pork fat in your magazine or else. By the way, you know they never push that on Islamic um, centers. You, you know that, don't you? You don't see them going, they know better, they probably get killed or whatever. But they never do that. It's only Judeo-Christian ethics they're after. That's the enemy, you know, or, or Buddhist or others. And I'm, um, 
Now, here's what we believe, and the church has taught this for years. At some point in the future, America will decline, and Britain will, Britain's already declined, if, if you ask me. Um, and it'll create a vacuum. Probably uh, a depression might precede it. And the world will face a new set of dictators will come out of that vacuum. Because, a va you know, nature abhors a vacuum. It's going to be filled by somebody. If the good guys pull away, it's going to be filled by bad actors. You already see that in the Middle East. It will happen um, in Europe and Asia, too. Let's go to Revelation 17. I know we're aware about Babylon the Great, but I want to just remind us, this is what the church has always said is coming, and it will be coming um, in the future. Maybe what we do in this election may have something to do with how fast it comes or doesn't come. Uh, we'll see. Uh, no one can be sure of anything about this, but here's what we know is coming at some point. Revelation 17, 2. It's talking about Babylon the Great. With whom the kings of the earth committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Now, this is spiritual fornication. It has to do with idolatry and ungodly things, but God uses that. That's one of the analogies of the Bible. Um, intercourse with paganism is like spiritual adultery. And that's what this empire is involved in. Verse 8, the beast. You know, if you think of Adolf Hitler as a beast of a man or Joseph Stalin, someone even more beastly is coming at some point in the future. And he may have more charisma than those two. The beast that you saw was and is not and will ascend out of the bottomless pit. Now, when you read that scripture, doesn't that fit the Roman Empire or the Holy Roman Empire after it got the, its religious stuff? It was in the past, and yet it's still there in Europe. You know, you listen to the Europeans, it's still there, and they kind of still use it, and Hitler and Mussolini use that title. It's still there, but it will ascend out of the bottomless pit. It's coming. You go into perdition. And those who dwell on the earth will marvel, whose name's not written in the book of life. In other words, when they see this empire come up in Europe, they're going to marvel at it. Now, we won't marvel because <clears throat> we've been predicting this for well, ever since I've been in the church. So we will see it coming. <clears throat> but they won't. And there may be some surprises that will fill out that scripture in more detail than we know now. Um, when they, anyway... Those whose names are not written in the book of life, I assume ours are, so it doesn't apply to us. In the foundation of the world, when they see the beast that was and is and was not and yet is, and they're going to be amazed when they see it. Uh, chapter 18, um, well, let's go to verse 5. Only because it's in all caps. I'm going to read it because it's in all caps. It, you know, the Bible doesn't put hardly anything in all caps. One of the few places... So that means God wants you to think about it. Verse 5. And on her forehead a name is written, Mystery, Babylon the Great. In other words, Nimrod's Babylon, the core of its religious anti-God stuff is still out there. I mean, maybe the, you know, Babylon was destroyed, etc., but the core of its kind of religious anti-God philosophy is still there. It's going to get bigger and stronger. Mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of harlots, and of the abominations of the earth. That shows you what God thinks of it um, on all capitals. 18.3, for all the nations. I want to emphasize the word all, 18.3, A-L-L. -L. This is a multinational, global empire. Even beyond the ten that rule it, it will have influence on probably all the nations to some extent, and a lot of them to a great extent. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornications. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And they're speaking spiritually now. And I'm not going to kind of confuse you. And the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxuries. Now, when you read everything about it, there are a lot of bad things about the empire that are brought out as well. So it's not all uh, goodness and sunshine. But Babylon the Great is coming back. And, it, the, <clears throat> and I'm going to give you uh, the view, but, I, but I'm not the only one that says this. 
there are others who are saying very similar things. As America becomes more globalistic and we elect globalistic politicians who don't respect America's borders or America's nationalism or America's heritage or America's exceptionalism, they want more a global community with the UN, like given the, the uh, internet and, and the control of the UN. As those people gain power in America, it will clear the way for, and maybe some other things like an economic collapse, will clear the way for this great empire to be formed. And you can feel it. You can sense it. We're pulling back. Now, I'm going to tell you a corny story. It's called Ray the Chicken. But it kind of makes a point. If you don't like the story, you can blame... Um, a guy who's in the church has sent it to me. I'll give his name later. <laughs> Ray the chicken. Anyway, Ray came home one night from a long day at work. He's getting old and he slid in bed next to his wife and fell asleep. Suddenly he woke up and he's at the pearly gates of St. Peter's. He says, wait a minute. It's too soon for me to die. I don't want to die. I've got too much life to live. St. Peter says, well, I'm sorry. You died in your sleep, you're here. Is there any way you can send me back to earth? He says, no. Is there any exception? Well, there is one if you're willing to become a chicken. Yeah. Okay. Boom. He wakes up, and he's got feathers all over him, and he's a chicken. Um, <clears throat> a rooster strolled past. So you're the new hen, huh? How's your first day here? Not bad, Ray replies, but... I have this strange feeling like inside me, like I'm going to explode. And the rooster says, well, you're just ovulating. Have you ever laid an egg before? No, I've never laid an egg before. Well, the rooster says, just relax. You know, as far as this egg laying goes, the rooster says, just relax and let it happen. It's no big deal. He did. A few uncomfortable seconds, he laid one egg. Poof. Then he laid a second egg. Poof. And he was overjoyed, motherhood. And he gets a slap on the head right before the third egg. Ray, wake up. You messed the bed twice. <laughs> His wife tells him. So getting old <laughs> isn't all it's cracked up to be. Uh, now you're going to say, how are you going to use that corny joke in your sermon? America may be about to lay a bad egg. The first, well, presidential candidate to be under criminal investigation before they're elected. Well, we'll see. Um, so my, all I'm saying is pray for America, pray hard. Um, and I would encourage people to fast, skip a meal or two or three, if you're able to. A lot does hang in the balance. Here's the problem. We will never hit utopia, paradise, or anything like that until Jesus Christ comes back. You all know that, and I know that. And we're not electing a saint or anything close to that. But one platform can slow down the calamity, as one man said. Slow down the madness. That's actually his own words regarding what he sees happening in Washington. Slow down the madness. And the other platform, we're on the expressway to decadence. Fast way now. And the longer they control the bureaucracy in Washington without a check by the other party, the more corrupt they'll get. Just think about that and you'll see what I mean. Um, <clears throat> let's go to Proverbs um, 6. Proverbs 6, um, we're going to pick it up in um, verse 16. These are very famous verses in Proverbs 6. You probably know where I'm going, but I will say it anyway. Proverbs 6, 16, and 17, read. Um, place. These six things Jehovah hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to the Lord. 
Verse 17, a proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood. One party backs partial birth abortion. Now what that means is the baby, it could even be, you know, he's gone the complete, you know, whatever it is, 39 weeks, the baby's ready, he's, he may be breathing, he comes out, uh, I usually it's head first, I'm not going to guarantee that's, I know they can switch it around, but usually head first, but as long as his feet are still in there, they can consider it a birth. The baby's alive, his head's out, and they take some instruments and, well, I won't tell you what they do to the baby's head. Um, and I just heard a guy say this on the radio, and I agree with him. He said, they're shedding innocent blood. That young baby, and, 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 and it's in their platform, they're for abortion, they're for publicly funding, they're making us help pay for it, public funding of abortion. They're hugging the Planned Parenthood president like she's, you know. And, oh, and, and the guy just said this on the radio, and I agree with him. If you vote for the party, that in their platform enshrines abortion anytime, any way, publicly funded, then aren't you giving support and license to spilling innocent blood? People say, oh, no. And I know a lot of people don't believe in abortion, vote for that party because they give them free phones or whatever they give them. But I think people need to think about it. You're, I know there are more than one issue, and they say, well, I vote for them for other issues. But if they found they couldn't get elected supporting that sort of thing, they'd stop supporting it. So if the people keep electing them and elect them this time, you're going to have a lot. We will be participating in shedding innocent blood. Just like the Israelites, would, you know, they'd beat the drums of Moloch and his little belly thing would be hot with a fire underneath it. And they would throw babies to Moloch, which obviously is painful for the babies and, and horrible. Um, you see that in the Bible. Aren't we doing, maybe we're doing it for financial convenience of the mother. Um, but it's almost like it's become a political in your face, God, by progressives. We know you don't like abortion, and we're going to push it, and we're going to win in spite of it. Um, and I guess they brainwashed the American people. But it's not that big a thing. A mother has a right to do anything she wants to the baby, even up to the time in which it's born. And actually, one politician said even days after the baby's born, it can still be allowed to, be, to die if the mother wants it. And I'm not making that up. Some of you know what I mean. If you think, He's making that up. Nope, I'm not making that up. Um, Christians should be a good influence on society. Pray, and even nominal Christians, at least they understand the basic Bible stuff, even nominal Christians have been in the past and can be a good influence on society. Um, let's go to Colossians 4.3. There's a whole lot more we could say. We said it last night on the podcast about how Christians have been a good influence on the world as a whole. Um, and I just think they don't teach that in school. They think religion is the biggest problem. Actually, a lot more people have died because of communism and secular stuff than on religious stuff. But I do concede that sometimes religious people do bad things, too. Of course, that's true. But they've done much more good than bad. At least Christianity has. Colossians 4.3. Meanwhile, praying also for us that God would open to us a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in chains. So Paul is saying, when you read the whole context, that we should pray that the government and the leaders allow Paul and the other apostles a doorway to preach the gospel. We should pray and vote for the party that wants to protect religious freedom. I can see the day where if they get enough power now, you know, there, a guy in Houston actually, and they're doing it in Georgia now, they actually are subpoenaing a guy's Bible for his Bible notes. And in Houston, they tried to get the guy's sermon notes to see if they could put him down because he's saying things in his sermons in his own church that are politically incorrect. Now, in Houston, it didn't work out. But in Georgia, at the moment, it's going. And they're subpoenaing the guy's notes and his Bible. Notes in your Bible might be considered contraband. And I'm not making this up. You think he's making this? Mm -mm. It's on. It, you listen to Christian radio, you hear about it. The mainstream media doesn't want to tell you that stuff because they want to keep 
the public in, in ignorance. And, you know, the media's job should be to be a watchman and a warning. Of course, they're not doing that. They're more just propagandists. They're fulfilling the role of a false prophet to a fair extent. So that's what I think of the mainstream media for the most part. And so in some ways, American people are being deceived and lied to. But that always seemed to happen to Israel as they went down. Galatians 3.28. <clears throat> when Paul wrote these words, just think of what the world was like. Galatians 3.28. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female, for all are one in Christ Jesus. You'll read stories about the Roman Empire. They say Christianity turned everything upside down. Now think about it. In those days, of course, the Jews felt better than the Greeks. People who were free felt much better than slaves. Men felt much better than women. And there are articles you can read about it in the Roman Empire. Paul said everybody's equal in Christ. Those words are like, 18 centuries ahead of their time. Christianity had a tremendous influence on the Roman Empire, so much the devil, at least as best he could, tried to co-opt it, uh, and on Western civilization. And, and it's been a good influence. Um, and I really believe that uh, a lot of the reforms, we could rattle them all off here, but we'll do that now, that the Western world had far ahead of the rest of the world at least in part, is because of the Bible. When the Bible got into the common man's language and general Christian influence. And most people don't know that. Um, so I say let's pray for America. Pray that the decision is the best you can get. Um, as someone said in the pot last night, we're going to be divided, like, and we already are, like we've never been, that maybe it won't get worse. I can see if things go a certain way, it could get worse and worse and worse than it. You know, we're going to be divided, but maybe it can work out where we're not quite so divided yet. Uh, but pray for that. We could enter a dark age like the famous book 1984, you know, where it's big government and they're spying on everybody and it's a gigantic socialist dictatorship and you can't say what you think and all that. Well, that may not be all that many years away. I mean, it might take a few years to get there, but it may be sooner than you think if the wrong people control the Supreme Court. You know, they'll pick judges that are young enough, they'll have 30 years on the court. Think of what it's like for you and your grandkids to be living in a world run by progressive activist Supreme Court. Not the Constitution or even their misunderstanding, but activists. Um, and so I'm going to ask the question, is it too late for America? And we're going to go to Jeremiah 14. I actually don't have the answer because we can't really know but I'll give my opinion. You can tell me later your opinion. Um, we can maybe even talk about it a little bit at the Bible study if you'd like. Jeremiah 14, 10. Jeremiah 14, 10 reads, Thus says the Lord to this people, Thus they have loved to wander. In other words, they like going away from God's ways. They have not restrained their feet. Therefore, Jehovah does not accept them. He will remember their iniquity now and punish their sins by implications now. Verse 11, the Lord said to me, that is to the prophet Jeremiah, do not, do not pray for this people. Do not pray for their good. There are a couple other places where God told prophets the same thing. I don't want to hear it. I made up my mind. I don't want to hear it. You know, I'm not going to forgive them. Um, and they did go into captivity, as we all know. Jeremiah's prayers were not able to turn the tide back. Um, they did go into captivity. Someone asked the question, is it too late for America? Have we become too secularized, too ungodly? Here's my opinion. There's still, a, and I'm, I know I'm being relative when I say this, there are a fair number of, of um, nominal Christians of all different faiths, who still believe in basic moral principles of the Bible. They may not understand certain doctrines as well as they should, so I'm not saying that. And there's still a number of people that are helpful. You meet them all the time in different meetings, and, uh, and they're nice people. And I don't know the percentage. As one guy said, I think we're being outnumbered. Um, 
by the evil people. He says it's so easy to produce people who want to join the, the more evil party because, you know, uh, everything, education, media, colleges, literature, everything is pushing people in that direction. So young people especially are moving in that direction more and more. As the older people die away, we're becoming much more that way. He's afraid we're outnumbered. I don't know that we're outnumbered. There are 25 plus million supposedly Christians who didn't vote in the last big election. That made it made a big difference. All I'm saying is, pray for America. I don't believe America is as bad as Israel was when, when uh, God told Jeremiah, do not pray for them. I don't believe we're that bad yet. I still meet a lot of, I'm, I'm being re reasonably good people. You know, I'm not saying they're saints, you know what I mean, but reasonably good people um, that are still out there. And uh, one final quote. If you do not take an interest in the affairs of your government, this, you are doomed to live under the rule of fools. And Plato said that. Plato said it. If the wrong party wins, now I'm going to make another statement that may be shocking. If the wrong party wins, do not despair. And here's how I mean it. And I've also got this from other people who said it. They said, if the wrong party wins, but we prayed, for, we prayed and asked God to intervene. If God doesn't intervene, that means it's God's will for maybe America and the world to learn some hard lessons sooner than, sooner than later. It's possible. God may say, okay, uh, all these people will learn some hard lessons sooner or later. It won't be good for us and good for our kids and grandkids, but if it's God's will, it's God's will. Don't despair. Um, the world's going to learn some hard lessons. And also, maybe the end of this Satan's age maybe will come a little sooner. <laughs>